Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for turning out on such a, a lovely day um, for perhaps the, hot, the second hottest ticket, if I dare say that, um, in, in London tonight. My name's Charlie Beckett. I'm the director of uh, Polis, which is the media think tank here at the LSE. And um, it's kind of our birthday. Next week, Polis celebrates uh, its fifth uh, year here at the London School of Economics. And in that time, we've had thousands of speakers at hundreds of events, and we've discussed and researched everything from uh, celebrity journalism to media and revolutions. Um, but overarching everything that we've done uh, has been our focus on the way that media uh, has changed and the way that, as it changes, it's changing the world. So I think there is no better way to celebrate our five years than to have one of the leading people who are leading that change. Um, Facebook, incredibly, is only two years older than Polis. Um, and of course, in that time, uh, Facebook has made slightly more money and uh, <laughs> a few more friends uh, than Polis has. But of course, that's only because they had a two-year head start. Um, our speaker today, Cheryl uh, Sandberg, is now Facebook's chief operating officer. Before that, she was chief of staff at the US Treasury. And uh, then she was vice president for global sales at another uh, little-known new media company called Google. Um, as I say, today London plays host to uh, an American global political leader, but we have uh, an American global media leader with us. She's going to talk about uh, how uh, media and new media is not just about technology, it's all about people. Please welcome Shel Sandberg. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you to Charlie for the invitation and to all of you for coming. So uh, this is a very friendly country. Over 30 million people are active Facebook users. It's half the population, so it's exciting for me to be at, in the UK. It's also exciting for me to be at the LSE. I studied economics in college, and when I graduated, one of my fellow students, one of my closest friends, was smart enough to enroll here and I for a graduate degree, and I went uh, off to the real world. And when I came to visit her on my first ever spring break as an adult, all I could think of to myself was, why didn't I do that? And so I've wanted to come to the LSE for about 20 years. So I'm grateful, grateful to be here. And I did warn them that one day I might just enroll if they'll, uh, if they'll let me. Um, so I do envy the students here, not just from a long time ago, but from now, for the information you have at your fingertips. When I studied economics in college, I had to run regressions for my thesis. These are calculations that any laptop in this room could run in less than a second. When I was in college, it wasn't so easy. I had to lug these huge mag tapes. Most of you don't even know what that is, but these huge tapes of data, and they were really heavy, all the way across campus, and that was kind of embarrassing. And then I had to stay up all night in the computer lab at Harvard, spinning the tapes to get the data inputted to the Harvard computer system so I could run these calculations partly because the systems weren't really up to it, and partly because I was really bad at this, I crashed the entire Harvard computer system. <laughs> it's true, years before our founder, Mark Zuckerberg, was old enough to even think about going to college, he probably didn't even know what college was, I crashed that same computer system that he then later became famous for crashing. In my case, no one made a movie out of it, so it's <laughs> much better to be me than to be Mark. That was 20 years ago, which I realize makes me old. Um, when I first started at Facebook, I actually didn't realize I was old. I felt kind of young, and I felt kind of hip. I was working at Facebook. Um, and then I was in a meeting. I had been there about a month, sitting next to this guy named Alex. And we're talking about launching a product. And he's saying, well, when we launch this, we need to make sure everyone can do it. So we really need to test this on, watch my hand, because I'm here, middle-aged users. <laughs> And I'm watching his hand, and then I realize he's pointing at me, I think. But that's confusing, so I stopped the meeting. I'm like, hang on, hang on. Alex, did you just call me middle-aged? Not even a smile. He goes, yes. <laughs> Alex still works at Facebook, which is a sign that I'm really nice. <laughs> so I'm not as old as Alex thinks I am, but I am old enough to remember before the internet. And I love saying that to people I work with. They look at me like, well, what do you mean? Like, well, what do you mean, what do I mean? I mean, before the internet, they're like, well, what was that like? 
you know, were there horses, were there buggies? I'm like, no, there were cars. It was just before the internet. But when the internet first happened, it was going to fundamentally change our lives. But its most applicable usage and its broadest usage was really in the phase that I consider, we consider the information web, which is it made all of us seekers of information. Everyone's experience on the internet was basically anonymous. In 1993, the New Yorker ran a famous cartoon with a dog in front of a terminal. And the caption, if some people are nodding, they've seen it, the caption read, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. The idea was that on the internet, you were anonymous. We went to websites, we pulled information, but no one knew who we were. Since then, there's been some evolution of the information web, but actually not that much. If you think about what you do on the web, most of the information you get is, based, is really based for everyone. And the only way sites can personalize is what you've done on those sites before. And this is really how much of the web still works today. What's happening now is what we think is a really fundamental transformation, a transformation from the information web to the social web. And the social web is different in, in two primary ways, but they're very profound. The first is that on the social web, we have real, ident real identity and therefore real, real personalization. So on Facebook, I am myself. I'm Cheryl. He's Charlie. She's Libby. You have to be yourself because that's the only way Facebook, Facebook works. You go on, you set up your identity, it's authentic, and then you connect with the real friends and people in your life. So it's real identity, real connections, and it's entirely personal. The second way the information web is different from the social web is in the shift from information retrieval to social discovery. So think about how you use most of the web. You know, you want to see what's going on in the world, you might look at the LSC website or the BBC website. You want to look at the weather in a city you're going to, you go to weather.com or MetLife. You have a topic in mind, you have a question, you go do a search. Now think about what happens when you go on Facebook. When you go on Facebook, you don't have a specific question in mind, otherwise you'd actually go elsewhere. You go on to hear from people. You're not retrieving information, it's social discovery. You get onto Facebook, and what you look at on your homepage or newsfeed is all the things that other people want to share with you. This is different. This is much more as we live our real lives. You know, if I walk up to my colleague Joanna in the office today, I might ask her a specific question like, hey, what time are we going to LSE to give that talk? But more likely, I'll say, how are you? Open ended question, and she gets to tell me whatever she wants. We live our lives mostly in social discovery. We live our lives not really in information seeking mode. That doesn't mean the information web's going away. It's not. It just means that the social web is powering us as individuals in a totally different way. We think this is why people are spending so much time on Facebook. The average user in the UK spends about seven hours per month with us. The number two website is far less than that at like about two hours. This is a fundamental shift shift from information web to the social web. A shift from the wisdom of crowds, where everything is done based on algorithms, algorithms on the mass parts of the population, to the wisdom of friends. If I'm looking for a restaurant tonight, do I want to hear what's the most popular in the city of the UK? Do I want the algorithmic answer from 300,000 people? Or would I rather trust the recommendation of my three friends? This is the shift from the what to the who. So people spend lots of time on Facebook, and they do lots of things. They share pictures, they poke each other. But Facebook, other than being a light thing we do every day, we believe is really transformative for relationships. Facebook, social networking, other sites as well. In some ways, this brings up really real questions about human relationships. These are questions I get asked, sometimes in an angry tone, sometimes not. You know, what does it mean to have a friend online? For people who have thousands of friends, do they even know what a friend is? Are you guys personally destroying the very idea of friendship? Will anyone ever talk to each other anymore? Or will we all just Facebook each other with blank stares and become no longer capable of having a human conversation? We think the same technology brings people much closer together. In March of 2006, Facebook rolled out the status update little box at the top of the page which originally said, what are you doing right now? And when that happened, some of you are nodding, you remember, everyone thought, 
what a silly question. Why would anyone want to know what you're doing right now? Why would anyone care, right? How can you communicate anything important in a format that short? And then years later, Twitter came out with a format that was even more constrained, 140 characters. Now people accept that this very short, very real-time form of, of information sharing is quite profound, that through the very small things in our life, we can share things that are quite deep. I have a group of friends from growing up from high school. That's even before I went to college, so that's even longer ago. And we all lived in Miami. We grew up together. We saw each other every day. There were seven of us. And then we went to different places for university. And so we couldn't keep in touch the same way. And we've written, we started by writing monthly updates to each other. Literally every month we would write a monthly update. At first we sent these in the mail, like the actual mail. Can you believe that? <laughs> then we got access to fax machines. Then we got email and that made it faster. And we were doing these monthly updates actually up until about a year ago. And now we have a Facebook group. And rather than get a monthly email, email update from my friend Beth, which tells me a summary of her life, I get these daily posts. Daughter's sick, raining, what should I do with her all day? Dog ran away, hoping he comes back, but not really sure. <laughs> I feel like I'm in better touch with Beth, because by sharing the details of her life, not only do I get that real-time understanding of where she is, but I get a more overall picture. The details added up are better for me than that monthly summary. The social web doesn't just connect us to people we know, but it connects us to people we don't know in ways that make them really human. Economists, and I know there are many economists and students of, econ of economics in this room, I was one as well, talk a lot about the invisible victim. It's one of the most profound and disturbing things in the world that we let millions of people die of unclean water, diseases that are completely curable or preventable or treatable. Why do we do that? The answer, one of the many answers economists give is that these are the invisible victims. Millions are faceless. Millions are too hard for us to process. Millions make us feel like we can't really do something, even though, of course, we can. On Facebook, people become visible. There was a woman named Kathy who got on Facebook a couple of years ago to join a group, uh, an event group, for her high school reunion. And she went to the page of a high school friend and then saw a link to another page, which was a friend of his, a woman named Beth. And Beth was a mother of two, exactly her age. They actually kind of sort of looked alike, who had one kidney functioning at 10%. And Kathy looked at this, and it wasn't just one of the 108,000 people that are on the organ donation waiting list in the United States, 18 of whom die every single day. But it was a real person with a real face and real pictures of her kids. And Kathy donated her kidney to save Beth's life. The invisible victim became visible. Lots of silly stuff happens on Facebook all the time. I won't pretend, pretend that everything is this profound. But on Facebook, strangers do amazing things for strangers. I think it's because they have real pictures and these people become really visible and truly human. One of the most urgent needs in any, any um, emergency is blood. The Israel Trauma Center set up eight Facebook groups for the eight types of blood, and they got people in advance to join the group so that they would be affiliated with the type of blood. And then when they have an emergency and they need blood, they post to those groups, often with pictures of the person they're trying to save. Quite recently, they got uh, a rare form of blood for a girl who was 15 years old in critical condition, and they saved her life within five hours. Once again, taking a stranger and making that stranger really visible. Facebook doesn't just let us share things one-on-one, -on -one, both with people we know and people we don't know, but importantly, it helps us form communities. If Facebook were one community, we are over half a billion people. That would make us the third most populous country in the world. But Facebook's not one community or one country. Facebook is millions and millions of small overlapping communities Groups tied together by background, by family, by friendships, by interest. It is through this community that we believe individuals are given a new kind of voice, a kind of voice they never had before. If you think about past generations and you wanted to get something out there, you could be famous and call a press conference. You could be rich and own a newspaper network. You could get lucky and get someone interested in your story. But most people did not have voice 
in a sense that they had a voice that was loud enough or distribution for their voice so that they could form communities. Suddenly that's changed. What used to only be powerful, the rich, for only be possible for the rich and powerful is possible for everyone. All of us as individuals have the ability to really distribute our voice. Now people have worked on this and honed these abilities and over the years these individual voices are growing louder and louder. Sometimes they take the form of a YouTube video telling us to leave Britney Spears alone. Sometimes they're far more serious. They go against things that really matter to our lives and sometimes they're for things that people just desire. A UK story. In 2003, Cadbury pulled the wisp -a bar off the shelves. It was a candy bar. They decided there was a new one that could come out. Sales were declining. They didn't need this anymore. Four years later, in 2007, with Facebook, a fan put up a page on Facebook demanding the return of the wisp -a bar, demanding it. That was followed by petitions online and offline, 93 Facebook groups, and one particularly um, aggressive fan who stormed an Izzy Pop concert with a banner saying, bring back the Wispa. <laughs> Six months later, Cadbury listened and they brought the Wispa bar back. And the next year they sold 75 million of those candy bars and it changed their performance for the year. Collective action can be done against things that are far more serious. In 2008, an unemployed engineer in Colombia named Oscar Morales set up a group against a page against the FARC, a terrorist group, an organization in his country that he felt had really harmed the country. Two days later, 9,000 people had liked that page. He was really emboldened by this, and so he then used his page to call for a march against the FARC. One month later, 12 million people in 200 countries marched against the FARC in what was and still is the largest anti-terrorist protest the world has ever known, started by one person, an unemployed engineer, because he had the power of this kind of voice. We saw a really extraordinary display of this new power recently in the uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt. I want to be really careful not to overstate Facebook's role in those revolutions. We are very clear what we did. We put out a technology, it's the exact same technology people use to poke each other. And in this case, people used it to reclaim their countries. They get credit for that, not us. Those are the brave men and women who marched in the streets and who risked their lives to reclaim their countries. It happened on Facebook, it could have happened on other tools, it could have happened on other things on the web. There's no, there's no misunderstanding why when the governments get nervous, they don't just shut down Facebook, they shut down the web. But the power of this tool was brought really home for us when in March of this year, the new Prime Minister of Egypt, Shafiq, resigned. And he's the Prime Minister of the country. He has every tool at his disposal. He can have a press conference, he can do a TV thing, he can do it online in print. How did he resign? He resigned on the Facebook page. He used the exact same tool that Oscar Morales used. This for us was an extraordinary sign that the leaders of our time are not just going to understand the new tools at their disposal, but they were going to embrace them. And a sign that the tools that give voice to individual citizens are also those that will be used to have voice uh, more broadly. The social web is not just good for um, organizing against dictatorial governments. We think it's useful for getting closer to elected governments, democratic governments as well. For many people, the closest they come to government are those great moments where they might vote or pay their taxes. If you're more politically active, and I imagine people in this audience are, you might attend a rally, you might volunteer to work on a campaign, you might do, be doing some cause-related marketing. But we think social media can bring us closer and give citizens the power to really interact with their government because it's personal and because the dialogue goes two ways. The 2008 presidential election in the United States was in many ways a turning point for the social web. Early on in the campaign, uh, the other side called the Obama candidate, candidate at the time, very derisively, the Facebook candidate. And that meant at the time that he was light and frivolous and only supported by the young and wouldn't win. Jokes on them. Obama used the web early and used the social web very effectively. He had a huge army of volunteers recruited that had never been recruited before. 
He raised money not from the usual suspects, but from new sources. And importantly, he generated voter turnout. About 23 million Americans between the ages of 18 and 29 voted in that election, which was an increase of 6 to 13% over the past two elections, the kind of increase people had been trying to do for a long time, but were not able to get to. We see greater engagement in public life, not just in the United States and in places like Tunisia and Egypt, but all over. We saw a lot of it here. Your last election was called by many people the first two-screen election because the TV screen and the computer screen were actually important. We um, put up a page called the Democracy UK page, which let users share information with each other about the election. We worked with your electoral commission to use our site to help register people to vote. About 280,000 people liked the UK Democracy page, and about 1.8 million people clicked I voted that day to tell their friends they voted. We, don't, we are not able to measure how many people voted because of the social influence of their friends or how much of any impact this had. But we believe that people are deeply influenced with their friends. And when people use the power of this to engage with government, we will see more active citizens. We'll also see increased accountability that our members of our government, our elected officials, and branches of our government have to their citizens. While governments around the world are seeing the benefits of greater engagements with their constituencies, commercial enterprises are no different. Today, more than ever in this world, brands are important to the identity of who we, of who we are. If you look on people's Facebook pages, their profiles, what you'll see is their representation of themselves. You'll see where they grew up, where they work, what they want to share. You'll also see commercial things. You know, on my page, you'll see the shoes I run in, the soda I drink, the artists I like. Every single day, 15 million people globally friend each other. Friend to friend connections, person to person. Every single day, 50 million people like a page. So more than three times. And those pages are commercial or public enterprises. They're politicians, they're artists, they're brands, <laughs> products, or services. This is changing the way business interacts with users across almost every industry. Samsung was going to launch its new Galaxy Tab in the United Kingdom. It's a rough launch. The tablet market has uh, gotten quite competitive quite quickly in most major markets in the world. So what they were looking for were early adopters who would spread the word that they had a great tablet. And they did some Facebook advertising and got 24,000 fans or likes on their page. Marketers have always known that the very best form of marketing is friend to friend. Sure, it's great to hear a message from a company, but when a friend recommends something, that's something you'll take even more seriously. Malcolm Gladwell, in the famous book Everyone's Read the Tipping Point, talked about people who serve as connectors, the kind of people who know enough people to connect and spread messages. Companies have been looking for these connectors for a long time. Every company has its own word for it, your special advocates, your early advocates. Uh, your enthusiasts, but they're looking for the people who are going to love their products or services and tell other people about it. Offline, if I have a good experience, I usually tell my sister I might tell a friend or two. But when this happens online, when it happens on Facebook, I tell an average of 130 people. In the Samsung example, by getting 24,000 people to be the early adopters and like their product, when they launched the Galaxy tab, they had 7 million impressions on Facebook which weren't just you know, ads, but they were user to user with friends telling each other, hey, I like this product. So Facebook can enable word of mouth marketing at scale in a way that hasn't happened before. Facebook also enables personalization. The fashion industry is a great example. It's an entire industry built on people telling us what's fashionable, brands and fashion houses talking to us. But on Facebook, these same fashion houses can also listen this is the personalization of fashion. Louis Vuitton, Hugo Boss are live streaming their fashion shows on Facebook now. Before you had to be in the elite and go to the, you had to get to Paris or Milan and get invited to the fashion show. Now everyone can watch. Kenneth Cole runs competitions on Facebook and online for their runway models. That is a much more democratic process than, was, than existed before. This works for Burberry, a UK company that really has done a lot on Facebook to have very authentic two-way dialogue with their users. They have a very active page. They use their page to drive sales off. 
And this is for them an authentic conversation that they believe wasn't really possible a few years ago. This is also working not just for the big brands, but for small businesses. In today's economy, small businesses are really important. They're the lifeblood of the growth of much of the economies around the world, and they're actually creating a lot of the jobs that I think all of our countries so desperately need. Facebook doesn't work just to lure customers into big stores, but also to give small businesses a voice, a voice just like the common man has. In the United States, there's something called Black Friday. Black Friday is the day after Thanksgiving, which is always a Thursday. It's a month before Christmas, and it's when the official Christmas holiday shopping season in the United States starts. And the companies that usually benefit from this are the big ones. The big retailers run tons of ads and have tons of sales. American Express, a global company, lots of customers in, in the UK and the US and other countries, they wanted to help small businesses participate in the pre-holiday sales. So they used Facebook to create a movement. They created Small Business Saturday. And they announced to everyone that you know, there would be Thanksgiving, there would be Black Friday for the big retailers, and then Saturday would be for small businesses. And they increased sales for those small businesses 27% year over year. What makes all of these transformations possible is a principle we call social design. Products and services that are built from the ground up around people. Things that put people at the center of the experience. People first, content second. Experiences designed around people have four things in common. One, your real friends are there. People want to share with the people they really know. Two, the product itself gives you a reason to share. Three, sharing is simple and fast. Make it too hard and no one does it. And four, you have control over your sharing. Privacy is of the utmost importance to Facebook. We want every user to know that it's your data and we're going to help you share it only the way you want to. Privacy controls have to allow you to share what you want with who you want and there has to be the power to enforce community standards and hold others accountable. Developers and companies all over the world are using social design and challenging incumbents. We have over 2.5 million developers working on the Facebook platform. And we think this is just the beginning because we think everything is better with your friends. We've seen the power of social design in our own products. Look at our photos product. How many people here have uploaded a photo to Facebook? Most people? Okay. Good, we thank you. Do more, please. <laughs> How many people have uploaded a photo to any other site? Most people have done it. So, you know, when I was in business school, if you had asked me to mock up the differences between all other photo sites and Facebook, I would have made a nice grid, and I would have listed all the features, and I would have had lots of checks for all the other photo sites, and very few one for Facebook. What do other photo sites do that Facebook doesn't let you do? You can't even rotate a photo on Facebook. I can't get rid of my gray hair. I have to do that actually in the real world. It's just so unfortunate. You can't, you can't print it out on a nice calendar and send it to your mom for her birthday. Our product doesn't do that much. Our product does one thing, just one thing. It enables you to tag your friends in an environment where your friends are. That one thing is so important that our photo service is by far the biggest in the world, bigger than the top three combined and growing ever more quickly. That's social by design. That tells you when you're building products that social functionality actually matters more than most other things. The gaming industry is fundamentally being disrupted by this. Zynga, a company that's less than four years old, has more active players than Xbox, PlayStation, and Wii combined. The large gaming companies looked at this and they said, wow, these games, they don't offer what we offer. Right? Has everyone ever seen any of the online Facebook games and compared them to some of these offline games? The graphics are not as rich. The experience is not, not as deep. Just like photos, the online games do not offer all of the features um, that the offline or these other, these other consoles did. But more people play them. It's fast, it's easy, and it's social. These games operate to get you to interact with your friends over and over. <coughs> Large gaming companies are increasingly seeing the power of this. And in 2009, Electric Arts acquired Playfish, which was a British maker of social games. We don't think photos and games are unique. We think every industry is going to be fundamentally rebuilt on the principles of social design. Let's talk about shopping. Shopping has been largely a social experience offline 
and a solitary experience online. We went from shopping with our friends or even getting the opinion of the person in the store to sitting at home and clicking alone. But look what's happening now. There's a global phenomenon known as haul videos, where girls go to the stores, they buy stuff, they video, and then they send it to each other. <laughs> These are regular girls. They don't have profit motive, they're passionate about the products and they want to share. And they become the marketers of those products to each other. There's a Facebook group around prom, and for men in the audience, you may not know this, but I promise every woman does. When you have what is the equivalent of the big dance, you don't want to be wearing the same dress as your friends. In the United States, around prom season, all the high school girls form Facebook groups. They take pictures of their dress and they post it to their friends, claiming the dress. This one's mine, don't buy it. <laughs> Solving a very, very important social problem that we're happy to help them solve. <laughs> No industry is more private than healthcare. But we think that social design, while completely protecting user privacy, is going to come to healthcare too, because social networks have a very profound Im impact on global health. It's been documented over and over by researchers that friend networks can contribute to the spread of diseases and key risk behaviors, to smoking, to obesity, to depression. Risks climb between friends. If you have a friend that is obese, your chances of being obese are actually almost two times greater than they were other than that, even if it's a new friend you make. People are also more likely to lose friends, to lose weight with friends, and so this kind of social behavior can have a very positive impact. We think social networking is gonna be critical in predicting the spread of disease one day. The Center on Disease Control in the United States can predict the flu two weeks after it happened. Very helpful. Google flu trends can predict the flu contemporaneously. Enough people type flu symptoms in and it can tell you, wow, the flu is breaking out here. There are some researchers at Harvard that wanted to see if using friend connections, they could predict the flu in advance. They took a random survey of a couple hundred Harvard students. They asked all those Harvard students to name some friends. Then they took the people who more people named, so the people that were better connected, and they just asked them when they got the flu symptoms and they predicted the flu outbreak two weeks before it happened. Think about the impact of that. We don't work in healthcare, we're a platform, others will do this, but we really believe that social by design will be very beneficial to the world in working on the healthcare problems that are so serious for all of us. Finance, we think this will get disrupted too. Corporate philanthropy and microloans have already started benefiting from social design. Chase Bank crowdsources their philanthropic initiatives rather than just give away money to local community. They've spent the last two years going to people online and saying, which local organizations do you want us to support? And they create this very viral voting campaign where people really get engaged with their bank and say, I want you to support this organization and get their friends to do it. Therefore, ensuring that the philanthropic money this bank is spending goes to where their customers or their possible future customers want the money to go. Kiva is a microloan company based in San Francisco, a nonprofit, and it crowdsources its microloans in developing countries, not online, but offline. Since 2005, they've given away $211 million in loans with a 98% payment rate. These examples are just the beginning. We think all industries, from commerce to banking to healthcare to every other industry, will eventually be disrupted by social design that someone who does something truly social will challenge some of the incumbents in these industries. For us, this transition to the social web is one that's really exciting because it's filled with endless possibility. We think this brings us closer than we've been in generations. We enable people to connect to save lives, connect to organize for democratic change, connect to restructure industries, and just poke each other when they feel like it. Sometimes this change seems overwhelming to people. It seems daunting and uncertain. But for us, we think it should be just the opposite of this. Because what this change is at its most basic level is familiarity. This is about connecting us to the people we want to connect to and then connecting them to other communities around the world. This should be familiar because it bridges the gap between the distance between us geographically and the real world and our human desire for connection. Like most bridges, we think this brings us closer together. We think that happens 
as the web gets rebuilt around people. Thank you. Cheryl, thanks very, very much for that. Um, in a minute, I'd like to open it up to people uh, to ask questions. Um, I should mention, by the way, that um, if any of you have managed to access the Wi-Fi, the Twitter hashtag is uh, LSE Sandberg. Um, so carry on. Um, I have my own hashtag. I'm not sure I've ever had that before. Well, you can't keep it. Um, <laughs> it's not yours. It's, it's ours. <laughs> it's everybody's. It's everybody's, really. Um, I just want to ask you, before uh, I throw it open to the others, I just want to ask you a question. You know, we're in a university. Uh, I want to ask you a question about something that you're not actually responsible for, and that's education, because you open up an amazing prospect here for people to have a lot of fun, have a lot of social engagement, uh, but also to do quite significant things, uh, to create businesses, to create social enterprises and so on. Uh, and uh, in the research you know, that we're doing in my department, um, that there's a, obviously a lot of unevenness around the literacies of people to actually take part in, in this on, on places like Facebook. What do you think needs to happen with education? I'm thinking particularly of obviously a place like the States and perhaps here, uh, and in general, what needs to happen in terms of education so that people can enjoy the happy prospect of what Facebook has to offer, do you think? I mean, it's very clear that as the world has gotten more global um, and as there's you know, increasing opportunity for people who are more highly educated, the people that are not as educated fall further behind. There's a widening gulf uh, between the educated and the prospects for them in every developed country and, and the people who are less than educated. You know, I think it's probably the most important long-run political uh, question is how do we educate our children? How do we give every student in the United States, in the UK, in any country we are, uh, the opportunities they deserve to happen? If it was hard to be illiterate in the world 30 years ago, which I'm sure it was, I think it's getting harder every day. Um, you know, I think there are obviously, and this is a great place to talk about this, increasing issues of global inequality. The Gulf is widening. Uh, in each country, and the gulf is widening uh, in the world, along with great progress that some of the developing countries are made. And so I think education will be the absolute key uh, to making sure that everyone has the opportunity to participate in our economy. But which countries are doing the right thing, and what are they doing? I don't know if I'm an education expert enough sure. to answer which countries. I can say that I think, and I think everyone in technology thinks this, that technology is not widely used enough yet in education. You know, why do we have teachers all over the world giving the same lecture? You know, the Khan Academy, if people have seen that stuff, is really incredible. You know, take the very best person at that and show everyone. I was at Google when we started the project to scan the Harvard Library, only the out of copyright appropriate books, no copyright <laughs> violations. But there were a lot of books that people are out of print or were out of copyright, and you could only get them if you went to Harvard. By scanning those books and putting them online, you took something that was available really to the elite and made it available to the masses in the whole world. That's something I'm very passionate about. And I think technology has been underused by everyone to really democratize access to education. OK. Perhaps, perhaps the LSE can sort the Wi-Fi out as well. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, take little clusters of questions, because there are literally hundreds of you that want to ask questions. And I'm going to start at the back, actually, in the cluster up there. The gent uh, in the white shirt where you are, let's start there, yeah. Um, where else are the microphones, please? Um, <laughs> thank you for your talk, Cheryl. Um, I'd just like to ask you that with regard to your um, experience at Google and Google's experience in China, um, I'd like to know where you think Facebook's role in China is going forward, because I know apparently Mark Zuckerberg is really pro-China, and obviously you being more pragmatic with experience uh, is not so positive. Okay, hold that one, please, yeah. over there. Yeah, right in the front. Uh, yeah, thank you, Seth Cheryl, for this amazing talk. And um, I know that you've been yesterday in Paris speaking at the e, um, G8 um, summit on the Internet Society. And uh, you mentioned an interesting idea. You said that your daughters, who are six and 11, right? They are yeah, not allowed. Three and six. 
three and six. Yeah. So they're too young to use Facebook uh, because the minimum age is 13, right? Um, so and they don't read, so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The U.S. education system. So, um, so, so let's, let's envision a world in 2050 where everybody will be on Facebook uh, eventually. Um, w how do you see Facebook's role in this world? Is it then this inevitable uh, big brother idea or is it the soul of the world or central government for people, by the people? How do you envision Facebook yeah. in an age where your daughters will be right. your age? Yeah, let's just start with the little questions. issues, little issues. No, yeah. <laughs> one more, one more. Uh, hi, Cheryl. Uh, I was looking on Twitter today. There's a, a Cheryl Sandberg Twitter page. There is. Someone there who's tweeted three times and then stopped around about <laughs> December. Uh, was that you, and why did you stop? Uh, <laughs> um, right. I those don't things. Twitter very often. I tend to put my updates on Facebook. I don't know if it's me, there may be, there, there is one that's real for me and there may be others, so I will, I will check that out. I do think I've done it more than three times, I probably <laughs> should, should get more, um, but it's a good question. I can take the other two together because I think they're very related. So our mission's very clear, we want to connect the whole world, and over the long run that means China as well. You know, how, what, where we get into the Chinese market is filled with a lot of questions for us and we're very much in an exploratory phase trying to learn how we best do that. Um, our approach all over the world is not really to control, but to empower. You know, we have, a text, we have a platform technology. People use it for the lightest of all things, wishing people happy birthday, poking each other, sharing pictures of their kids. And they use it for the most serious of all things, you know, finding people to save lives, to get their children kidneys. Um, I don't know how the world will use Facebook in 2015. I hope a lot of the world does. But I know that they'll use it in ways that are important to them. And I know that we won't try to control those ways. That our idea is to provide a platform so that people can do whatever they want to do. And I think what you see is really the full range of human activities taking place on Facebook. Excellent. OK, let's take another little round. Let's start down here with, uh, sorry, and sorry, I forgot to say, could you please, it's um, only polite if you could just say who you are before you ask your questions, that'd be great. Uh, Rory Kathleen Jones uh, from BBC News. Uh, Facebook sounds like um, a wonderfully self confident company uh, growing very rapidly. If it's so, so self confident, why did you need to hire Burson Marstella uh, <laughs> to plant smear stories about Google? Let's keep going. Okay. I yeah. promise I'll answer. Yeah, he got, he got my question. Um, uh, ben Rooney from the Wall Street Journal. Um, one of the, uh, at the heart of one of your things is uh, you say that it, we're moving from the idea of the wisdom of crowds to the wisdom of people. When you go onto quite a lot of blogs and you go and look at these things, they're full of very stupid people. Um, <laughs> what is the, the problem? And in a serious sense, not only are they stupid, there's, there's a lot of, uh, they become very, they become great echo chambers. If your circle of friends uh, uh, simply reinforces prejudices, and we see that, for example, in, in, in uh, fundamental uh, 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 religious groups, um, is there not a great danger that actually you become an amplifier of the wrong message? Okay, then the lady in the front in the red. Yeah, uh, hard to follow those questions. <laughs> uh, my question is a bit more simple. I was actually surprised that you mentioned privacy as one of the points of pride of Facebook, um, particularly given, you know, um, certain ways in which settings have been changed, not communicated, until someone suddenly tells you, one of your friends, by the way, you know, make sure you go back to your settings, there's something new. How do you um, see your, you know, Facebook attitude to privacy? And how do you balance openness with um, the use of the platform as a marketing tool? Yeah, so I can take them in order. Um, to the, the question, oh, did you want me to do another one? No, no, Sorry. please, go Okay, okay. Uh, to the question you asked about person, we put out a statement on this and we stand by that statement as a company. Um, you know, we were trying to bring to light a very serious issue. We believed that if we brought it to light as Facebook, people would just focus on the competition. But we were trying to bring, t between the two companies, we were trying to do it, um, to do it in, in, a, in a more offhand way. And we actually, it wasn't a smear campaign or anything like that. It was trying to get reporters interested in looking at this. Does he feel comfortable with that, with that tactic? 
You know, um, we put out a statement as a company that means the whole, the whole company stands behind it. And what we committed to is that we don't think it was the right thing to do and it wasn't transparent and we won't do it again. So we're very comfortable with that stance. Um, I do think it is interesting that uh, there has not been that much follow-up from any reporters on the fundamental underlying issue of how the data was being used. And I do think... <laughs> potentially, potentially, but we think this is we think this is serious, and we think it's really important for data to be used in ways that people are um, are comfortable with. Um, to the question on people are idiots, apparently online. People, Sorry. yeah. <laughs> um, I think I think your question gets to something very profound, so that you know any tool that can be used can be used for good and bad. Cars, fabulous to get places quickly; they kill people. You know, media does some good, does some bad. I don't think there's anything anyone invents that doesn't have that. Um, we believe that the amplification of voice over time does increase tolerance, increase understanding, not decrease it. We think in terms of comments on the web, uh, authentic identity has been very powerful. There are a bunch of media sites that have gone public <laughs> that they've had anonymous comments, and then a couple of them have gone through Facebook, login, and actually gotten rid of the anonymous comments and only had people post with their names. And all of them have said the same thing, which is the comments got better. They may not all be perfect, but they got better. That a lot of things that people feel very comfortable doing anonymously, they don't want to do it with their real names attached. Um, we don't think this perfectly improves the dialogue in the world, but we think it does both. We also note that Facebook's only one of many tools. It's not that the information web and the inf wisdom of crowds is going away in any way, shape, or form. It's that you now have both. And I turn to the information web for certain needs, and I turn to the, the, uh, the friendship web for others. I'm going to have to start writing these down because I'm forgetting Sorry, the question. Privacy, yeah. Privacy. So privacy is really important to Facebook. If you think about most of the web, most of the web is either closed or open. You know, you go onto a blog, completely open. You go onto, you know, your corporate email, totally closed. One of Facebook's biggest innovations was in the area of privacy. You know, one of the innovations we had is that actually as an individual, there are some things you want to share with everyone and some things you want to share with very few people. So I could take a picture of myself sitting here on the stage today, even though I feel that many other people may be doing that right now, so yeah, I wouldn't need to. Have, yeah. But if I wanted to, I could take a picture, if this were a private event, and I could share it just with my mom, I could share it with just with my group of high school girlfriends, or I could share it with the whole world. Facebook gives you the ability every time you get on Facebook to share the information you want with uh, the people you want, you want to share it with. As our products roll out, we actually always roll out privacy controls in each and every product we roll out. And it's something we take very seriously. We are also the innovator in products. And I think it's fair to say that sometimes it's been confusing for users, not because we've wanted it to be, but because if you take <coughs> privacy as seriously as we do and you always roll out a control, you have a lot of controls on your site. There's a balance here between full control and simplicity. We could make privacy incredibly easy on Facebook by just giving you no options or giving you one or two options. Everyone would understand it. It would be completely simple. We could give you perfect control. We err on the, which is more control, but it's more complicated. We always err on the side of control, and then we do the best we can to explain it to people. And that's because we believe that people are becoming increasingly sophisticated users of these products, and we believe so deeply in user control. We believe that our commitment on privacy is one of the fundamental things we give users which enable them to share, and it's a commitment we want to keep adhering to, even if it takes some explaining on our part. I'm going to start writing this down. It's harder yeah, than exactly. I thought to remember. Just a very quick mindless poll. First of all, how many, is everyone on, who's on Facebook? Thank you. Do it more. <laughs> who, who isn't? Tell your kids to who, spend more time who with isn't, us. Who isn't? Okay. So there's some refused. Excellent. Of the people, of the people on Facebook, hands up if you would use the phrase, I am worried about my privacy on Facebook. The okay. communication challenge is real. Yeah. <laughs> well, we will I, have to do a better job. You know, on the end, I worry about my, my car. You see my driving, you know, um, but I still use the thing. Um, let's take some questions further back or in the middle rank, if we can. Um, hands up, please. Right, there's one in the, right in the middle there. And then there's the guy to your right there. OK. Yeah, uh, the, yeah please. Uh, who's going first? In the middle, please. Hi, Sharon. My name is Richard. Uh, 
a lot of what you described is very impressive, but it's difficult to see to the naked eye. So can you say who you are? That's not just introduce. Sorry? Can you just say your name and then ask? The Richard. Richard. Sorry, Richard. Sorry, I didn't hear this. <laughs> so <laughs> it's my hearing aid. That's okay. It's difficult to see to the naked eye how you how Facebook generates revenue from a lot of these activities, and I'd just be interested to know what are your key streams of revenue, and how do you prove to your customers that it actually works and delivers for them in terms of sales. And also my second question is, what are your key concerns and what keeps you awake at night? <laughs> Please. Um, <clears throat> my name is Damien Tambini. I'm a lecturer here, although I won't be for much longer if your proposal for virtual professors is taken <laughs> up. No, 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 no. No, you're going to be the virtual professor. No, no, you're going to be the but virtual I professor. But I have a more you're serious question. And broadcast all over the world. As long as they take me, you're fine. Um, more serious question. I think you ducked, with respect, the, the China question. Um, and maybe we could be a bit more specific. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of the Global Network Initiative, mm -hmm. which is following the um, intervention of uh, various committees of, of US Congress, questioning the role of US communications companies in non-democratic countries. The Network Initiative was set up which establishes a set of principles on privacy and on freedom of expression. And a number of companies have signed up, including Yahoo and Microsoft. Um, are you uh, engaging with that uh, process of the Global Network Initiative? Um, and uh, will, will you do that? Because I think maybe you could say a little bit more about the nature of your engagement with the Chinese market. Um, and added to that, the, I mean, it's, you gave a very positive spin on, on the democratic role of communication, but there is another side, which is that uh, these communications can be used in a way which is very visible and transparent to the state. Do you, do you think you have a responsibility not only for privacy, but for security of those privacy settings and ensuring um, that users are protected in yeah. non-democratic countries? Okay, it's a lot, a lot. there. That's a lot. It's a lot there. But let's quickly take the, the third there. Hi, uh, sorry, my name is Varun, and I just wondered, who owns the content of my Facebook page? Is it me, or is it Facebook? And I specifically, well, I mean everything, but I also mean, like, the photos, especially, and the general data, because the data that's on my Facebook page, you can probably build my personality out of. So I just wondered who actually owns that information. Great. Okay. I do that one first, because that one's fast. You own it. It's yours. You can put it on. You can delete it. We don't own it. Uh, well, we, we store it for you. You've put it on Facebook. <laughs> one of the biggest, one of the things we worry most about, you know, we had a, a bug a long time ago where people thought we lost their photos. They were very upset. We found them. We got them back. That was good. Well, you don't want us to delete it unless you delete it. So you put it on. We store it for you. And if you want to take it off, you can take it off, but you own it. And we do our best to leave it there. And we don't have those problems. So that was an easy one. Um, uh, let me go around the revenue question. So we make our revenue primarily through advertising. We run ads on our own site. We label them as, as sponsored. Um, in terms of proving to our advertisers, uh, we work with them on the metrics, and we work with Nielsen. And they have measured effectiveness on our ads. And our ad campaigns have been really good for advertisers and I think quite good for users. We've had fun things happen, like you know, if the Ford Explorer launched uh, the Ford Explorer, the new one on Facebook, Mazda did that. We just had a big ad campaign you may be familiar with, with BT for the wedding, the BT wedding. Did anyone see this? There was this uh, kind of Facebook TV wedding between two of BT's stars. There was a big ad campaign to get interest in that. And they got about, I think about 480,000 people to vote on every aspect of their wedding. That's an example of a, of a Facebook ad campaign. Um, what keeps me up at night? The list is quite long. <laughs> You know, we're growing really quickly as a company. Um, I actually think the most likely things that go wrong are things we do ourselves. We just get it wrong. I always note how when companies list the threats to them, they're always external threats. But really, most companies just mess it up. So I think what keeps me up most of the night is we'll just get it wrong. We'll eliminate too slowly, we'll innovate too quickly, Mark and I will make bad decisions on something. You know, I really think we need to worry most about our own role and what, what we do, what we do and how we make how we make those decisions. 
Um, to China, I am a little bit familiar with the Global Network Initiative. I know we've had conversations with them about, and we totally support their principles, and we're discussing ways of engaging. Um, I wasn't trying to duck the China question. We actually don't have an answer. We are only intermittently available in China right now. We are mostly, mostly not, um, mostly, you know, some people can access us, but most can't. And so the question is, how would we become available in that market, and what are the steps we would take to get there? And there's just an enormous number of things to work through on that, and we don't know. We're very much in a learning phase. Mark very publicly went to China over the holidays and met with people. We've had ongoing conversations with different, different companies in China. And as soon as we figure out the answers to this question, we're, we're going to answer them. We just don't know what we're going to do yet. What about now? The, the, sort of the Evgeny Moritzov question, oh, I think. Oh, sorry, the, 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 kind of the transparency. Security. Yeah, so Facebook can be used in a very open way, and Facebook can be also used for movements. If you start a page, you can have a public administrator of the page that no one knows who that administrator is. And so we take the privacy and security of people very seriously. There are people who want to start movements who choose to tell everyone they started it, and people who start movements on Facebook that want that anonymity, and that anonymity is protected. In terms of the security of the site, we take that incredibly seriously. Um, early on in some of the Tunisia thing, we thought there had been a potential large-scale security breach, and we very aggressively moved to get all of the users that we thought <coughs> might have been compromised to change their passwords. We wouldn't let them log in until they change their password. So we're pretty sophisticated technically. We are very focused on the security of our individual users and very focused on protecting them. Very active protectors of that security. Okay. Let's take some right at the back, please. Everyone's um, cheating because they're two-part questions, yeah, which is know, fine. I, I just have to remember to get all of them. Start right over the there, and if you could go back up to the guy in the black. Hi, thank you. My name is Daniel. I'm from the Students' Union at LSE, and I'm also representing the workers of the Unite Here 11 union in Disneyland, California. Um, you are a member of the board of Disney, and so my question is, you talked about invisible victims, and I'd like to know what you're doing for the invisible victims right under your nose. In California, Disney hotel workers make under $9 an hour. For those Brits, that's less than minimum wage here. Now. Disney is saying, we're going to take away your health care and your family's health care. Cheryl, what will you do to keep <laughs> decent health care for working families that are invisible and right under your nose? Okay. So just a f question about the, the future of Facebook. Who's speaking? Um, so Sorry. Facebook has stretched and tested people's um, openness and tolerance towards privacy. Um, now, um, two features that come to mind are the, the Facebook beacon and the news feed. Now, last week at the Reuters conference, I believe, you mentioned that fa a Facebook IPO was inevitable. Now, with the scrutiny cast by stakeholders um, with varying risk appetites, will it stifle the innovation that has made Facebook the company it is today? That's my question. Thanks. And then there's the gentleman down. Oh, there. hi. Um, several news sources are sort of suggesting a, a new tech bubble, you know, with uh, Skype and uh, LinkedIn having these very high valuations. And then, you know, Facebook, you said it's sort of an IPO is inevitable, and a lot of people are estimating it to be around 100 billion. Uh, is this something that you discuss at Facebook? Is it something you're maybe worried about that you might have a sudden deflation of value? <laughs> That's the invitation to talk. Can I get another course. question? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm I have another one for ads. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so to the Disney question, I am on the board, but it, that's not a board issue we talk about, and so I'll have to defer to the company, but I'm happy to get you in touch with the right person if that's helpful. Um, to the question on Beacon and Newsfeed and innovation, um, it is interesting that there are things that happen where companies innovate where they kind of get it wrong, and I think at Facebook, for Facebook, Beacon was something that Facebook got wrong. It was actually before I joined, but obviously something I've looked at really carefully. And Beacon was something that the product wasn't well explained, and no one understood it, and it was pulled back. Then there's innovation where people get it right. So actually, the largest protest Facebook ever had was against Newsfeed, which at the time, people were really concerned about, because before that, Facebook was a static site where you went to people's profiles. And all of a sudden, information, even though it was totally public, was being pushed to you. 
You know, Mark really held his ground on newsfeed, and even though a huge portion of the population of Facebook at the time was protesting, really held his ground. And not only did users get used to newsfeed, newsfeed has fundamentally changed technology. How many experiences that we all have are based on feeds now? The idea that information is pushed to us is not just something we accept and embrace, but something we accept. Um, I don't think the IPO changes this. I think the question innovative companies have is when you put something out and people protest, is it Beacon or is it Newsfeed? If it's Beacon, you should pull it back fast, faster than they did, and Marcus said that publicly. If it's Newsfeed and you pull it back, you've just taken away something the world really wants and is really good for people. And so I think the biggest challenge we face is when we have those moments where we give something new and people don't like them at first because people don't usually like change, how do we tell which it is? And that's something I think not just our company faces, but all, all companies face. Um, to the IPO question, you know, we aren't a public company now, which means we don't have a public company valuation, and therefore it's not something we have to spend a lot of time on, which is something that's good about being a private company. So we'll enjoy it for as long as we can. <laughs> and uh, how long how long's that? <laughs> That's a press question. I'll give out the date later. Okay, great. Thank you. Excellent. Um, let's take some more. Let's go over this side, please. Gentleman on the end of the row there in the blue, uh, blue jersey. Thank you. My name is Laibuta. I'm a Master of Law student at LAC. Facebook has been taken to be one of the biggest time wasters. <laughs> I, have, I have exams soon, but hear my speech? Every, every, every day I have to look at my Facebook update on, and all that. But at Facebook, how do you control this? Do you have restriction on how employees use Facebook and how many <laughs> are Excellent, excellent, excellent. Sorry, this one to the left. Man. Hi, Cheryl. Um, my name is Josh Doug, and I'm an e-commerce consultant at Deloitte. Um, my question was around cultural transformation. So, um, in your, from your time at Google and from your time at Facebook, what have you found um, to be the most effective ways of managing the change that you inevitably are going to have when you go from a tech startup to being a truly global enterprise? Wow. Explain it all. And then, gentleman in the grey suit in the middle there. Thank you. Hi. Um, first of all, my name is Ryan Denroyan. Um, thank you very much, Cheryl. That was an absolutely wonderful presentation. Um, the one thing you didn't touch on, and which I thought was very interesting, is you mentioned the social web a lot. And of course, a couple of years back, it was all about you know, uh, the semantic web and how are we going to navigate these seas of content. And as you've mentioned, you know, gamification, curation, you know, they're now the hot new topics. And they're very, very applicable to social networks. So you know, it's, it, it makes sense. But then, of course, I love my friends, but when it comes to you know, recommending you know, music or perchance restaurants, they might be lovely, but so half the time they don't have a clue, you know, they have completely different tastes, and you know, maybe they don't have a clue what they're talking about. I'm just listening because I'm being nice. It's building social capital, which is why we have these relationships and spend so much time, wasted perchance, um, on Facebook. And of course, Google is really targeting the weak ties with, their, with plus one, and the whole idea is that you can like things and you can almost, you know, you can get feedback from these things, even if these people are way outside your network, although not more than six degrees of Kevin Bacon, apparently. Um, so the, my question for you is, how, what, how, how do you see the role of weak ties, um, especially you know, uh, as, as the Facebook graph develops further, and how, what role do you see algorithms, uh, you know, dreadful word, I know, um, you know playing, playing in that? Thank you. Um, so employees using Facebook. So at Facebook, we don't consider Facebook a waste of time. That's shocking. <laughs> It's the great thing if you really like Facebook, come work at Facebook. You can do it all day, and people think you're doing research for your job. My team here is nodding, so that's, that's great. Um, but we actually use Facebook very actively for work. We have active social tools and discussion tools. A lot of the work of Facebook gets done on Facebook. We form groups for every project, and we really use it as a productivity tool. And we see other companies doing it, doing it as well. But it's something we use. We believe that using our own product is good for our product development. So we're very active users of Facebook. You know, Mark and I tend to Facebook message each other, not email. For example, we do the same thing with our, our management group. The cultural transformation question is a hard one. Um, you know, I uh, joined Google when it was about 250 people. I left when it was over 20,000. I would say there's many cultural transformations in that. I joined Google at about, I mean, Facebook at about 550, and now we're about 2,500. A couple of cultural transformations in there. Um, I think the most important thing for all of these companies as you're doing cultural transformation is to acknowledge and talk about rapid change and acknowledge and talk internally about rapid change being hard. 
think one of the things I did when I joined Facebook is I, I talked about internally, I'm like, this is hard. Because going from a company of 500 people to 2,000 people means you don't know everyone anymore. Going from a company of 70 million users to over 500 million users means we need to get more efficient in our job, not less efficient. And I think understanding the challenges are really important. For the Facebook culture, we care about one thing most of all, and this is really led by Mark, which is we care about innovation. We want to be a company that continues to push out new products rather than get slow. And so every engineer who joins the company is expected to write code to the site in the first week. And we still have a push, meaning we push products out, the code into the system every week. We don't want to be a company that pushes once a month or once a quarter. And that's how we keep our culture, is we stay tied to those rapid, rapid uh, bits of, of, of innovation. The way we do that is by keeping the team small. If you're working with a team of six people, you can be doing that in a company of thousands or a company of hundreds, but you only have six people to work with. We're trying to keep the team small and defined so that we can uh, rapidly innovate. Um, in terms of your question, I take your question to be about mainly curation. You know, what information, glad you're nodding, I got it right, what information are you going to get from whom? And our idea is that you can use lots of tools, you can use Facebook, and you can use Facebook as you want. So we have a questions product now. You can pose a question to the whole world, or if I want, I can pose a question just to my group of girlfriends. I can also go to other places and ask questions or do the same thing. And so for us, we think there are times when you know there's this one person whose music taste you really like and you're just going to ask them. And we enable that or you can pick up your phone. You know, there are times when you want the more algorithmic wisdom of friends and, you know, we offer that through the web search and other people offer that as well. And so we don't think there's ever, uh, you know, one, one chief fits all answer. There's just different things you want to do at different periods of time. I love that phrase. It sounds like a... Uh, uh, title of a novel, the algorithmic, is it the algorithmic friendship? Yeah. Um, ben. Hi, uh, it's Benjamin Cohen here from Channel 4 News. Um, obviously, this event has a Twitter hashtag, and there's, I can see Facebook people sitting there right now on Twitter talking about uh, how they say uh, talking about today. Is there an acceptance that there is this other there's this other force in the social web, um, which is Twitter? and that for news, Twitter is just so much better because your algorithm, as great as it is on Facebook for your news feed, doesn't necessarily show you what's happening right now. Is this something, and you've obviously appointed someone to sort of be an ambassador to journalists, but is this something that you really think Facebook can compete with Twitter in, in breaking news, in being about live events, or, is, or are you happy to accept that there's something else there that maybe one day you might buy? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this, this takes, right after the RIP yeah, update. Yeah. Um, sorry, let's take right at the back. Sorry to get you. Can you go right to the very back there? That, What's next for Facebook? Ooh. What products are coming out? I know that there's going to be a shift in the summer when um, all games will be required to use Facebook credits. Are there any other things that we can look forward to? And then, just, just there, to your left, guy in the black. So, my name is Nathan. Internet companies like yours are now taking actions which we normally expect of states. Things around uh, whether someone is permitted to have a Facebook group or whether it needs to be taken down. You have lobbyists. You're now building a diplomatic team. What is Facebook's strategy for exploring the new legal and political frontiers? of organizing censorship and revolution. Um, so I can take those in turn. Um, so on Twitter, you know, we think we are not the whole social web. There's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's actually Jamais in China. There's lots of players in the social web. We actually increasingly think that we think there's a place for Twitter, a place for us. We encourage journalists to do both. Um, we think people get a lot of distribution on Facebook and they can get a lot of distribution on Twitter. We actually think it's not just going to be Facebook and Twitter. It's not just that there's room for both of us. We think more and more of the web becomes social. More and more news sites will become social. That there'll be both the curation of ideas through, through news feeds and through editorial reviews and also through friends on sites. So we're actually pushing our technology to the BBC and others here into, in, into other, to other places because we think it's really important. So uh, the social web is really broad. 
Um, in terms of what's next, I'm not going to make any product announcements. I hate to steal any thunder from the summer. Um, but we will have more product announcements. We're continually evolving the products. Um, we've made some, some changes lately, and we'll continue to make them in terms of making photos better. I think our photos product is evolving um, and looks better and better. I think we're going to continue to see things that make Facebook hopefully uh, easier to use, faster to use, and more fun. Um, Pause there. Can I, just, can I just ask you, what would you like to do? What would you well, like just to let us know. We'll roll it out. What would you like? <laughs> <laughs> interesting okay yeah sorry to interrupt um and the facebook strategy on you know kind of legal or political strategy you know we are a platform we're a platform to be used we don't have a you know a revolutionary strategy to revolutionize countries that's not our line of work um but we are interested in the differing the differing ways and the differing ways people use it and so as the product evolves i think it's been interesting to see what's happened so far and i think more and more will be done through people's through people's both their social graphs their social connections and through the public, they can reach on Facebook. OK, great. I think we're getting towards the end. Let's take another uh, round right there. There's one here, please. Uh, Cheryl, Emily Maylis from the BBC. Just going back to uh, some of the questions uh, that you approached on privacy. When we were at school, when we were at college, we could behave as badly as we wanted, and there was no one around uh, with the iPhone to take the picture that you would regret forever. Now it's out there. It will stay uh, on Facebook, on the web for as, as long as that person wants, even if it's not tagged on your site. What do you think's got to change going forward in terms of attitudes? Presumably, you're not going to say that teenagers uh, will never get drunk, and presumably you're not going to say that people will never take photos. Uh, do you think that attitudes, for example, of uh, employers, of bosses, between the public and the private is shifting, or is that something that is going to be of general concern? Hmm. That's a good question. Then there's a gentleman in the middle there. Yeah, hi there. Dan Channer. Um, the I can see who's speaking. Hi. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Hi, Cheryl. Oh, in the centre, yeah. Dan Channer. Um, the talks, it's all about people, and it's very interesting hearing the, about people, which is really about sort of emotional connections. So I guess my question is for Cheryl, the person, not maybe the politician or the senior business person. How much does it motivate you every day to come out and kill Google because they wouldn't make you COO? <laughs> 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 yeah. Gentleman at the back top. There. Hi, my name is Lee Morganroth. Uh, I work in a startup that specializes in digital privacy. I wanted to thank you for taking so much time for questions. It's really fantastic. My question is about a different kind of personal information, which is behavioral data. And it's the data that Facebook collects and controls. Oh, and it's the data that Facebook collects and controls. It's behavioral data, data that most users are probably not so aware of that Facebook has that's becoming more and more valuable to your customers, advertisers. And it creates a potential conflict of interest. So I'm curious as to how Facebook makes decisions around what kind of information to share with advertisers and how to educate their users or make that information transparent to them so they can make smart decisions about what their role should be in that. Okay. Okay, so to the first question, um, to the iPhone, people taking pictures, pictures question. You know, Facebook is unusual, unlike the web. When you put something on Facebook, you can delete it. So there actually is more control with Facebook than there is with much of the web. That's right, but your friend, but let's, I was about to acknowledge, your friend can take a picture of you and put it up there. You know, if as an employer, Facebook didn't, didn't hire anyone who had pictures of themselves drunk in college, we would have exactly no employees. <laughs> and so, yes, I do think there are, there are, you know, attitudinal shifts. I think, you know, I'm 41. Had I been walking around with pictures of myself drunk at college parties, I might not have gotten a job. If you are employing kids coming out of college, you know, we don't check the Facebook profile of people we hire, but other people do. And I think if you find behaviors on there that the entire generation exhibits, you either employ from that generation or not. So I do think there's an increase in comfort. That doesn't mean I, you know, 
tell people to put whatever they want online and not worry about it. But I do think that sometimes we have one generation judging another by its rules rather than by their contemporaries and looking around at what happens to the contemporaries can at least make you sleep easier at night as a parent. Um, in terms of what motivates me, um, you know, we are not trying to, you know, go after any one company. Importantly, we're not going after search. So if the motivation, you know, were to kill one company or go after Google, we would be launching search. It's not what we do. We are trying to stay true to who we are and build out the social functionality um, that underpins, you know, human connections. Um, what I find most motivating are some of the things I talked about. You know, building a product that enables me to stay in touch with my parents and my parents see pictures of my kids or building a product where people donate organs to strangers for me is really, really important. I really believe in the mission of Facebook. I love what's happening to put power behind the technology of individuals. Um, there's, we have a site up called Peace. It's uh, Facebook. Dot, is it peace.facebook.com? Yeah, peace.facebook.com. And it's a little site. All it shows is in real time all the connections that have been made between individuals in uh, areas that are you know, generally in conflict or historically in conflict or religious groups, Palestine, Israel, you know, Christian Muslim, Christian Jewish, Jewish Muslim, Greece, Turkey, like anything that was traditionally um, kind of at odds with each other. And we just show in real time every 24 hours the connections that have been made. You know, you get online and you will see thousands of people in Palestine and Israel have connected in the last, you know, 24 hours. You know, I don't take myself or anything too seriously. I won't sit here and say we're promoting world peace, right? We put out a technology that people use to poke each other to. But I actually believe that it's harder to shoot at people you know and that enabling those kind of connections really matters. There's a guy from the US State Department named Alec Ross, and he's gone around giving speeches. And he used to say that he thinks you know, we should stop fighting wars in these economies. We should just put in Facebook and let the next generation connect. And those personal connections would matter. And I really believe that. I don't believe it's everything we do, but it's enough of what we do that I get out of bed every morning and, and feel good about it. Um, in terms of digital privacy, it's a really important question you asked, and I want to I clear up a couple, of, a couple of things. The first is that we have no information about you that you're not aware of. So what is traditionally done in the industry on behavioral targeting, which means I am following you around the web and looking at what you do, we do not do. That is not something uh, Facebook does. We give exactly no information to any advertisers about any individuals. We do all our own ad serving. And so, you know, if I'm an advertiser and I want to, you know, sell, promote a movie to, I'll pick myself, 40-year-old women living in California, we take the ad, we show it to 40-year-old women who live in California, and we never give a single name or piece of data back. We'll give the advertiser aggregate data. You know, your ad was shown a million times. 5% of the people clicked on it. You know, the P, those people were in this age group on average. No personal data changes hand. Um, we don't collect any information about you that you're not aware of because we don't follow you and because you input all your own data on Facebook. That's not true across the whole industry, but it's true for us. Great. Listen, we've taken a lot of time, uh, Shell's time, but I'm, can I push you just to take one? Yes, let's do one couple more. more. Just, that's fantastic. Um, uh, let's start that side for a change. Uh, the lady there, please. Yeah. No, no, in front of you, to your right. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, can, I, can I go? Um, my name is Fiona, um, and I just wanted to let you know, Cheryl, that I saw your TED Talk, and I kept my hand up, and <laughs> so I asked a question, or I'm going to ask a question. Um, I was curious, kind of following up on Charlie's question, and then maybe the first question you took, where you said that your, entire, your whole goal, one of the main goals of Facebook, is to have the entire world to be connected. Um, you know, the internet is a great democratizing force, but there are still people that don't have access to the internet. Um, you know, there's a tremendous urban-rural gap, not just within education, just in terms of basic access to the internet. Um, and I'm curious as to whether or not you see Facebook facilitating any kind of corporate role in terms of, um, you know, providing internet access to people at all. Okay, and then the gentleman up there, I'm gonna go ahead. Hi Cheryl, my name is Fawad. Uh, just a quick question. We, um, back in the 50s, 40s, 50s, we had things like commodities where you'd empower farmers, for example, to have 
wheat and copper and corn and all of these things. Nowadays what we have is Facebook and our commodities now are people and as people we are sold to big large multinational companies. Our, for example, like you were saying, if you have 40 year old women living over in California, that they, that's sold on to marketers and then they can target them. To what extent is that going to end and when are we going to be seen as people and not commodities and not been, and not been made for profit? Okay. And the last question is going to be the chap there in the suit. Uh, hi, my name's Peter. Would Facebook ever deploy a facial recognition product? Um, so to the first question, where, where is that? Thank you for keeping your hand up. I'm glad you saw my TED Talk. I care about this a lot. Um, um, we have worked hard to make Facebook available even to people who don't have internet access, but there's mobile access all over the world. We put out a lighter, easier product that could be used even with more basic non-smartphone mobile devices. So we've worked hard to give access to Facebook, um, Facebook all over the world. We are not laying pipes and making internet access available. We're a small company, but we care a lot about people having access and our technology working on mobile devices, particularly mobile devices that aren't smartphones, which are the kind of mobile devices you see in the developing world. Something that matters to us a great deal, and we've seen tremendous growth there. Um, to your question on, on people and advertising, um, there's two possibilities for funding Facebook. One is users can pay, and the other is advertisers can pay. The number one question complaint issue we get from our users is, are you going to charge me? Every time I say publicly we're not going to charge users, that, that's reprinted. And so, you know, we've talked to users and gotten lots of feedback on whether they would rather see ads, just like TV, or they would rather pay for the service. And overwhelmingly, our users say, please don't charge us. We'd rather see ads. And that's our business model. I think it's the right decision, particularly because we do it in a way that's really, um, really very, we lead the web by far in privacy and the advertising model. We also provide a little Xbox. Can't get rid of all the ads, but if you want to get rid of an ad because you particularly don't like it, click it out. You won't see it again, and we'll ask you for feedback on why that particular ad bothers you. We do take user feedback. Um, facial recognition. We do have some facial recognition uh, products out there uh, which help you tag photos. So if you've tagged someone, it helps you tag that person. You know, I tagged my sister. It will then say, is this your sister, to make it easier to tag. So we've done some of that with our photo, photo tagging product. Great. Listen, we, we have run out of time, um, and it remains for me to um, thank some people who have made this all possible. I want to say a big thank you to uh, Linklater's law firm who have been supporting Polis Public Lectures uh, this term. I want to say a big thank to your team in London, actually, who have helped us make this happen, and especially to my events team and to Sashi Doctor, who has helped uh, make this event happen. But most of all, by way of saying thank you to you, I want to give you something that the LSC traditionally gives to uh, speakers like yourself, that we've given to Mr. Clinton and Mr. Mandela. Uh, it's extraordinarily expensive and very well made. Uh, th thank you so much, Cheryl. That's been a fantastic speech. Thank, thank you very you. much. I'll give you something that we have not given to Mr. Clinton or Mr. Mandela, but oh, we God. would if they wanted to, um, which is a Facebook jacket, which I hope is well made. Thank you very, very so, much. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate it.